Hi, welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks to those who have already introduced yourselves in the chat. Lindsay, Brianna, Megan, so great to have you. Um, I am also a 2017 alum, so fun to see some class of 2017 represented. Uh, if you are here to talk about investing, you are in the right place. Uh, this is the last in our Young Alumni series. So for those of you who are returners, um, you may have been here for home buying or car buying. Uh, we've done side hustles. We've done quite a bit and we figured we would save the best for last. Uh, so we're talking about investing tonight. You may notice if you are a returner that we don't have Nancy here tonight. Uh, we do have her in the audience, uh, but we're going to put Ryan on the spot. Ryan is a former firefighter turned investing expert. Uh, he has a dog at home. He has a kid at home. Uh, so he, he knows the whole jam. If you've got dogs, if you've got cats, if you've got kids and you haven't already heard me say it, we won't turn your photo or video on tonight, uh, nor your audio. So make yourselves comfortable. Feel free to use the chat to share any questions, ideas, thoughts. Um, I've gotten pretty good at interrupting Nancy and now Ryan, so I will be able to ask those for you. Um, but with that, you didn't come here to hear me talk. So if you haven't introduced yourself, I, I encourage you to continue to introduce yourself in the chat. If you send it to all panelists, Ryan and I will see it. If you send it to all panelists and attendees, everyone will see it. Um, and before I turn it over to Ryan, I just want to give a huge thank you both to Canvas Credit Union and our Alumni Association members. Um, so we have about 70 people registered for this webinar tonight, and about half of you are Alumni Association members, which is huge. Um, between Canvas and you all, you make this programming possible. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and with that, we are going to dive into investing. Ryan, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I'm um, really excited to be here. This is my first uh, webinar presentation. I've attended lots like you guys likely have over the past six months, um, but this is my first one, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, this evening, we're aiming for um, discussing investment basics. Uh, we'll start with some fundamental investment concepts and then review some investment options and uh, general investment strategies. And then finally, we will uh, discuss how you might go about allocating your investment dollars. In the end, I'm hoping that uh, this will help you guys better understand investing in the whole nature of the finance world, at least when it comes to uh, investments uh, that are not limited just to stocks and bonds, as you'll soon see. So I'd like to start out with um, a, a question, and I'll need some help with this. What does investing mean to you? That is not a rhetorical question. I am looking for, a, for some audience support here. And feel free to pop that in the chat. If you want to send it to just all panelists, I will read your answers, but keep your name anonymous. Um, that goes for anything you just send to panelists tonight. If you want to be brave and daring, send it to everyone. Um, we got one, putting my money to work for me. Nice. Saving for my future. That's good too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So putting my work money to um, my money to work for me uh saving for my future and at the end of the day it's a little bit of both right it's it's not it's not only just saving um but it is also making your dollars um do their own work so uh you know essentially we're talking about compound interest we'll get more into this later uh but you know the the more effort we put into this um, the closer we get to a carefully planned and prepared approach to managing and accumulating money. Um, it takes some discipline, some patience, uh, but it doesn't really have to be difficult. Um, fun, the, some of the fundamentals to keep in mind, I mean, one of the biggest ones is the effect of inflation. And over time, um, inflation can have a, a substantial impact on our purchasing power. 
according to the U.S. Department of Labor, since 1914, inflation's been about 3%. And so at, at 3%, something that costs you $100 today would cost you $181 in 20 years. And to, to flip that around, if you were to have saved $200,000 today, which would be awesome. Um, I mean, if you had $200,000 stashed in your mattress, uh, I can I can make, you know, three conclusions. Uh, one, you got a lumpy mattress. Two, lucky you. And three, uh, in, you know, uh, 20 years, that $200,000 is really only going to be worth $108,000. Um, the mattress will be the same size. The lumps might not be quite as big. You probably warm down after 20 years, but you're still going to have a lumpy mattress and the $200,000 in there is only going to be worth 108. And that, after 40 years, we're talking about, um, uh, what is it? It's just over 69. Yeah. It's 59,142. Uh, so, <clears throat> inflation is one of those things that we really have to keep ahead of. Um, sometimes we think that a zero percent, a zero percent rate of return, is 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 the worst case scenario, right? Um, but in fact, three percent is really what we're is really our floor, right? That's that's really what we have to stay ahead of in order to have the same the same buying power. Does anybody have any questions about that? Because that's where some of them come up. Doesn't look like it yet. Um, but again, feel free to utilize the chat at any point tonight and we'll interrupt with questions. Yeah, cut me off anytime. Um, so compound interest. Fortunately, we have compound interest that helps to fight um, the effect of inflation. And, and one of the great things about compound interest is that uh, many of us have, especially those of you watching, I would expect, um, have uh, one of the biggest assets, and that's time. Uh, the time value of money is, is powerful. And so if we assume the growth, if we assume $5,000 is invested every year, which currently in a, a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, you can invest $6,000 a year unless you're over the age of 50 and then you can put in seven. Uh, but if we assume a 6% annual growth rate and all earnings invested um, over the course of 30 years, we're talking about almost $400,000. And, and so that's a, that represents a total of $150,000 invested uh, compounding 6% per year. And so it turns your 150,000 into almost $400,000 and that's compound interest. And, um, that's your money working for you. I have to click on the right screen. So there we go. The rule of 72, this is one of the helpful ways that you can calculate uh, either your rate of return or how long it will take for your money to double. Essentially, you just take 72 and divide it by your rate of return and or the years in which you have to invest, right? These two, the denominator can change, uh, but 72 divided by either the years that you have to double or the years you want it to double or the rate of return gives you... Um, the other factor. So 72 divided by your rate of return, let's assume a 7% rate of return, you end up with uh, seven years is how long it will take. 7.2 years is how long it'll take for your money to double. Now, the reason I bring this up is because this is a helpful way to think about how much you will have uh, when you retire. The first doubling isn't going to be that big of a deal. But as you continue to save and you make saving a priority, you pay your retired self before you pay your bills, um, then you know that that that's where that those those monthly or annual contributions really 
have a lot of power for you guys. Um, as those doubles occur, you know, you get to the third or fourth or even fifth double, that's a really big deal. If we can see a 7% rate of return, that means your money is going to double every 10 years. And um, some of you may have 40 years that, that you can uh, that you can remain invested in the market. Um, the possibility that we see a, a higher than 7% rate of return, I have no idea what the future holds, but we can all cross our fingers, right? So the point here is that sooner is better. And getting started as soon as you can is absolutely huge. It pays huge dividends. Um, for example, you know, uh, contributing $3,000 at 6% growth, uh, starting at age 20, um, you'll end up with, you know, 680,000. Um, if you start at the age of 35, you end up with 254,000. And if you don't start till 45, you end up with 120. So it's never too late and don't get discouraged. But the point is that sooner is better. And, and with many of the, the younger folks that I talk to these days, um, they are putting off having families or they have some extra money that they are able to save. And everything that you can put away early on grows. It, it just That's just more money to double more times. And um, anything you can do to to save more now for retirement is a uh, is is very very powerful. Um, there is always a time in, in in the future. I think in everybody's lives where um, our family is in their their biggest spending years, and it's like all we can do to keep our head above water, much less save extra money for retirement. And so there's there's typically a period where we're doing just what we can. Um, it's important to remember that the vast majority of people actually save their money uh, in the last 10 to 15 years prior to retirement. Um, so keep that in mind. Can I interrupt you with a quick question, Ryan? Yes, ma'am, please. All right, this is one from the chat um, and it's one that comes up with our young alumni a lot. So being on a tight budget, this person can't afford a financial advisor. And even if they could, it seems that advise, advisors available through some institutions just conveniently also have just what they need or a quick fix. Um, do you have recommendations on how you would go about finding someone who is working in their interest and not just for making a sale? Yeah, um, a, good, a good starting point would be your local credit union. Um, that's gonna, you know, that's, uh, I apologize for the shameless plug, um, but the you know Canvas is really good at finding advisors that uh, put the interests of their members and the interests of their clients first. Um, you'll also see if you do a little bit of research on the Department of Labor's uh, fiduciary duty. The fiduciary duty requires that an advisor. Uh, not put their own interests first, but rather the interests of their clients. While that seems reasonable, to me, it feels like a relatively low bar, but that's just me. Um, the biggest thing I can say is that uh, if you feel like you need an advisor and you are not interested in doing this yourself and doing the research and following the markets and everything that it entails um meeting with someone that you're comfortable with is a is a huge just being comfortable with the advisor that you meet with uh, having a rapport um feeling like there's there's a uh, some trust there that you can build up that's a that's a big part of the equation did that answer your question awesome thank you if there's follow-ups feel free to continue to utilize the chat but um so far we're looking good We'll assume we'll assume that's a yes. Um, yeah. So some of the fundamentals: um, identifying goals and time horizons. So uh, some types of goals that we might have when we're we're discussing investing in, initially would be retirement. Um, you know, college in the future, college for the kids. 
uh, some kind of special purchase, like a first time home purchase or financial security, just wanting to be more stable. Um, I am hearing some people mention now uh, financial independence, um, creating a stream of income that is independent of, you know, the, the, the nine to five job. Um, one of the other considerations is uh, short term versus long term goals. Uh, how long we're investing has a huge impact on what our investment options are and also how aggressive or conservative we can be. Um, in general, you know, the longer your investment horizon, the more risks you can afford to take, but that also has to be balanced with uh, how well you sleep at night. Um, some people are very comfortable knowing that their money is at risk because they understand the relationship between uh, risk and reward. Others understand that relationship fully, but just are uncomfortable with the possibility of, of losing some of their assets, uh, both of which are, are certainly understandable. When it comes to risk tolerance, um, you know, this can be very subjective. Uh, it has to do with the, uh, the ability for you to watch your account fluctuate. Right. It's going to go up and it's going to go down. Uh, that depends a little bit on how you're invested. But um, it, it's there's always going to be there's always going to be changes. And so the, the more comfortable you are with the changes, the more risk you can take and the more uh, growth you can see over the long run. Um, the relationship between risk and return uh is not linear as this might lead you to believe uh but there are lots of options um everything from options and futures this would have the most risk uh common stock all the way down to u.s treasuries and cds and somewhere in here i would put inflation uh three percent um inflation you know like currently, for example, example, treasuries are well below inflation. And so there is inflation risk somewhere right in here. Well, I guess right now it's right about here, uh, somewhere below corporate bonds and somewhere above government bonds. So there is a cost for safety. And safety or stability is just one leg of the stool, if you will. Um, we, there's always a trade-off between uh, safety and stability, growth, and income. You can have all three, but you can't have all of all three. Uh, you have to give up something for, um, for one of the others. And to some extent, that is the role of a, a financial advisor to help you understand how comfortable you are with growth and how comfortable you are with um, with safety and, and the lack of, of return or uh, the lack of volatility if we're using more income. So this next question may tie into that. Um, thinking yeah. about a significant amount of student loan debt, folks walk away with that often. Um, this person says they have 35,000 in student loan debt and paying the minimum on income-based repayment plan in order to save invest a little bit that they can each month. Would you encourage this practice or suggest paying down that debt first? Oh, that's tough. What's the interest rate? Well, if the interest rate is low, um, you're, on the, you're on the payment plan. If the interest rate is low, uh, well, here's what I'll say. Um, you have to balance out the interest rate against what you may earn, <clears throat> excuse me, in a long-term investment portfolio. Uh, and that's, I mean, that, that's, that's a tough question. Uh, ultimately, that comes down to what we can expect out of the market over the next five, 10, 15 years versus what the interest rate is. Uh, you also have to balance that out with your own personal um, comfort level with carrying debt. There, there are some folks that uh, want to avoid debt at all costs. And 
some of us just can't help it. So that's a complicated situation. I would encourage further discussion with a, a trusted financial advisor. Perfect. And if it helps, um, the interest rate looks like at 6.5%, if that changes that answer at all. Um, so six and a half. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Um, assuming those are retirement savings, like, and granted, okay, so you have to understand that this is not, we're not doing a personal consultation here. Um, but, uh, with the information that I have paying down those student loans is probably going to be a priority over the next five years. Um, I'd want to talk further before I give you a solid answer on that, but with a six and a half percent interest rate, that's good. That's really competitive with market returns, if not beyond market returns, uh, unless you're super aggressive, super, if you, unless you're very aggressively invested, um, we will see, I have no idea what the market's going to do. I am not um special in any way my crystal ball uh, never existed and it there's no telling right the market's going to go up or it's going to go down or it's going to go sideways at the end of the day the best investment advice is to invest based on long-term goals um and uh and make sure that you're invested to achieve those those goals while still being able to sleep at night um, so that's a tough that's a tough position to be in. Well, thanks, Ryan, and thank you all for the questions. These are these are good ones. Keep them coming. Yeah, they are, and I wish that there were some easier answers sometimes. Um, but it, at the end of the day, they they just aren't. So some types of investments uh, you can see some of those here: cash, bonds, stocks, other alternatives. And keep in mind that these are just types of investments. Right. These these uh, can be held. All of these can be held inside of a 401k and an IRA. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that an IRA is not a type of investment. It's just a vehicle. It's like a Christmas present. Um, if you picture all the boxes under the Christmas tree, they all have different wrapping paper. And that is uh, you can you can liken that to um, the tax advantages or lack thereof. Um, so investment options, uh, look, when we're, when we're talking about low risk, we're also talking about short term, relatively liquid, um, possibly some, sometimes, uh, low risk investment options are not relatively liquid, uh, but they include things like CDs, money market, uh, accounts at your favorite local credit union, <laughs> canvas, <clears throat> excuse me, canvas, uh, money markets, U.S. treasury bills. And as we move and some of the advantages and disadvantages include predictable earnings, highly liquid, um, but they may not keep up with inflation, like I mentioned earlier. As we move up the ladder, we talk about um, bonds that um, are liquid. They can be traded and their value does fluctuate. There's an inverse relationship between uh, bonds and interest rates. And so that's something to keep in mind when interest rates are really low, um, the value of bonds can, um, it can be hard to, to, to generate much of a rate of return. While there's always that coupon, um, it's a consideration. So some types of bonds include uh, US government securities, muni bonds, corporate bonds, uh, and these can get very, very detailed and confusing. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages, bonds uh, typically provide, typically we think of those as, as fixed income. That's what we refer to them in the industry because they are uh, generally to, to either balance out the, the risk that we're taking with stocks or they are used to, to generate income. Um, as we move on up the ladder, stocks uh, are essentially a percentage of ownership. So you actually are, are an owner of the company, whereas with bonds, to contrast that, bonds are essentially a loan 
to the company. So they represent two very different positions. Both stocks and bonds can be sold at a, at a gain or a loss, depending. When it comes to stocks, there are uh, lots of, of different options and categories. You can use uh, common stock versus preferred stock, uh, small cap, mid cap, and large cap. All the, all the caps in there refer to market capitalization. And so a large cap or a mega large cap might be something like Google or Apple. And a small cap would be, uh, I could list off a number of them, but you likely haven't heard of any of them. Um, you have, stock. oh, sorry, Go ahead. Ryan. Yeah, yeah, do it. Um, in the current unsure future income tax situation, do you have advice mm -hmm. on one route to go versus the other route? Um, if you were going to jump in as a new investor, where would you jump in? Uh, and th the question at, pertains to income taxes? Says, so the exact wording is, in the current unsure future income tax situation, what is your advice? Well, I would, I would be curious as to exactly what uh, about the future income taxes, uh, what Okay, well, that's my question here. My question is, is your income tax future uh, unknown because you're graduating and um, you're gonna be having a, a salary or, or whatever? Is that the reason or is the income tax situation possibly gonna change in the future due to, I don't know, like a $3 trillion deficit? Um, both of those would be slightly different answers that I would provide. Um, at the, though I will say this, let's wait till the end of the presentation and see if you still have that question. So let's, let's table that for now. Um, investment options, stock terminology, terminology, growth, value, income, blue chip, uh, ADRs, those are companies that are based outside of the United States. That comes with uh, possible tax disadvantages um, using ADRs. So if you're if you're running your own portfolios, um, keep that in mind. So with stocks, historically they've provided the the highest long term returns. Uh, they are easy to buy and sell. They are typically totally liquid. Um, they are subject to market volatility and greater risk to principal. There are other options outside other outside of stocks and bonds, uh, real estate, um, collectibles, you know, futures, uh, options, option chains. You can get really complicated if you want to. Um, Mutual funds are beneficial because they pool money together. So you can invest with a much smaller dollar amount. It doesn't require uh, $10,000 or $25,000 or $100,000 to get started. Typically, you can start a mutual fund with only you know, $250 to $500, somewhere around there, maybe $1,000. Um, keep in mind, before investing, investors should Carefully consider a fund's investment objectives, risks, and charges and expenses. These can be found in the prospectus available from the fund, which should be read carefully before investing. You'll see that again. Three major investment categories. Um, money markets, bonds, balanced funds, stock funds. Uh, they all, and international, they all have they all fall in different locations on the risk return spectrum. Um, they are similar, right? A stock fund is made up of stocks. A bond fund is made up of bonds and balanced is of course made up of both. There is, this is a huge debate, the active versus passive debate. Um, the the great thing or not so great thing about uh, the amazing Google machine is that you can find information supporting any perspective you choose. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave that to many of you to, 
to investigate further. One of the one of the resources I do recommend for folks is Investopedia. It's like uh, encyclopedia, but for investments. Investopedia that can be a, a great place to start learning about some of this stuff. When it comes to mutual funds, advantages include uh, diversification, possibly professional management if it's an active fund. Uh, disadvantages include uh, fees and expenses, largely. Um, I usually choose uh, to use a doctor for my doctor stuff and I'll pay for it because they're a doctor. Um, so it's one thing to keep in mind. Um, in, in other investment options <clears throat> include ETFs, which are really similar to mutual funds in that it's a pool of stocks and bonds. Uh, so you can get invested instead of spending a thousand dollars for Apple or, or whatever the, the cost per share is currently. Um, you can put in a thousand dollars and get a whole bunch of different companies. So you get instant diversification and typically ETFs are passive. They are typically not actively managed um, and they are usually cheaper than actively managed mutual funds. Uh, but not always. They can provide tax efficiencies over mutual funds depending on the turnover. So we can get into details here. Again, with ETFs, before investing, investors should carefully consider a fund's investment objectives, risks, and charges, and expenses. These can be found in prospectus available from the fund, which should be read carefully before investing. I should just record that. So some investment methods, uh, dollar cost averaging. This is likely something that we all will do at some point if we have a 401k especially, uh, but it is one of the most effective ways to invest. It, it's, a, it's an opportunity to buy into the stock market in um, a variety of situations. Given that none of us know exactly what the market's gonna do, um, if we just invest uh, either the same amount of money, ideally the same amount of money, what we end up with is we buy a variety of uh, share amounts. And so you can see, you know, if, if we buy 10 shares, um, we buy 30 shares, depending on the, the, the fluctuation of the price of those shares. Um, over time, we can end up actually saving a little bit of money. The cost there is, is minimal, and this is a pretty substantial fluctuation here. Uh, $30 um, for 10 shares versus $10 for 30 shares, that's a huge market fluctuation. Um, that represents something, uh, that's, that's a, a more significant decline than happened in 2008. Um, so typically the dollar cost averaging is helpful, um, but the benefit is, is, uh, arguable. Oh, I apologize. So some considerations when we're discussing ass asset allocation, uh, diversification, uh, risk tolerance, how long you're going to be invested, uh, your personal situation and how much liquidity you really need. Um, all of those change with each individual that I talk to. It's, it's rare that I provide the same amount, the same advice um, to, to anyone, to be honest. Uh, and can I jump in real quick, Ryan? For those who are brand new to the investing world, will you explain what liquidity is? Sure, thank you, that's a great question. So. Uh, liquidity is um, the ability for you to get your hands on your money, essentially. Um, let's compare and contrast um, a uh, let's let's use a, a bond. Let's use a, a municipal bond, right? Um, a bond, a Fort Collins, um, maybe even a CSU issues a, a, a bond, um, and so you can buy this bond and whether or not you let's say you need some money you will have to sell that bond to someone else um 
On the other hand, if the money is in your reverse tier savings at Canvas Credit Union, you can walk in and, and pull it out whenever you're ready. So, you know, one, some things have more liquidity than others. And that's a huge uh, consideration when we're talking about getting invested. Does that make sense? Was that a good answer? 10 out of 10. 10 out At of 10. At least in my score. opinion. Um, if folks okay. on the call disagree, feel free to pop it in the chat. All right. Oh, yeah, we're doing We're going to do a poll. Awesome. Um, so some sample asset allocation models, you know, conservative asset allocation would include 50% in bonds, 25% um, uh, in stocks, uh, maybe 25% in international. Um, as we get more aggressive, we're going to include more in bonds. Uh, more, uh, I'm sorry, less in bonds, more in stocks, and more international. And then when we're really aggressive, we're talking about mostly invested in stocks, uh, some bonds, and, and even more international now. So typically the role of a financial professional really is to help you figure out exactly, uh, you know, your risk tolerance, um, possibly your time horizon, and to help you set those goals. Uh, we can help you create an asset allocation and um, to select specific investments. Uh, probably one of the biggest advantages is that we are um, a relatively independent third party, right? We're unemotionally um involved in the situation I'll, I'll say this i have my own financial advisor i don't always like what he tells me but um he's not emotionally attached to performance so there's a lot to consider things get really complicated and um i will say one more thing uh and then we'll we'll open it up to questions for everybody so start getting those into the chat if you've got some um, The, as many of you know, you don't need, uh, and a financial advisor is not required to invest, right? Uh, there are lots of opportunities. Many of you, um, I suspect, are, are more um, more knowledgeable about some of those options than I am. Um, but you know, mutual funds, ETFs, stocks, bonds, all of that stuff is available to to everyone. It's no longer uh, no longer do you need uh, a broker or uh, a uh, you know a licensed professional in order to open an account. You can do those all over the case. Um, but when it comes to investing, having somebody that's on your team that's a professional is um, usually beneficial. So there's my my disclaimer. And what kind of questions do we have? Perfect. We do have a number of questions in the chat. Um, and for those of you who have additional questions, feel free to continue to pop those in the chat. I also should have said it at the beginning, but you may have noticed that we went through the information quite quickly tonight. We will share the slides and the recording. So for those of you ferociously writing, I apologize, I did not say that at the beginning. Um, you may have also noticed that we had another face join our call. So Brian Ruff and Ryan Muff, uh, both financial advisors with Canvas Credit Union, um, and they are here to answer your questions. Because investing is such a broad topic and confusing topic, we left plenty of time for questions. So again, please don't hesitate to use the chat. Um, but going back to the last slide, Ryan, will you talk a little bit more about what an asset allocation model is? Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. So an asset allocation model, um, it breaks down the uh, your exposure, the portfolio exposure to um, to different categories, to different asset out to different asset classes. Uh, so it, it, with this one, we're we're, we're talking about 75 percent in stocks, 10 uh, percent in cash alternatives. Um, to some extent, you can include 
uh, let's just call it cash alternatives, and 15% in bonds. So an asset allocation model will change. Typically, it will change based on how close to retirement you're getting. However, uh, sometimes we invest for a very specific reason. So the asset allocation can, can change or not depending on why we're investing. And, and, and that's, that's a big part of the discussion. For example here, so that's our aggressive allocation, our moderate allocation, uh, slightly less aggressive. We have only 50% in stocks. This means a moderate portfolio will uh, fluctuate less. Uh, so if you have $10,000 invested and you're in a, a moderate portfolio, um, if the market moves violently like it did in March, uh, maybe with a moderate portfolio, you only see a 15% fluctuation. With a um, with an aggressive al asset allocation model, you might have seen a you know a 25% uh, fluctuation. So each one offers separate benefits and separate costs, uh, and and they're both. They both ought to be um, specific to both you and your goals and objectives. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Um, as a follow-up, at what point should you consider getting a financial advisor? Um, do you think it's better to just dive into investing on your own to immediately look into a financial advisor? Um, is there a limit as far as how much you're investing where you might consider a financial advisor? If you had advice to offer, what would you offer? Yeah, um, I, would, I, would, I would put it this way. Um, if you enjoy learning about this stuff and you like the idea of managing your own portfolio and being very hands-on and and tracking the markets and tracking investments and learning about fundamental analysis of uh, fundamental analysis is, is the um, uh, looking through a company's balance sheet and cash flow uh, and reading their um, all of the, the documentation that they're required to put forth being a, a, a public company. Um, if you can get good at and enjoy learning about fundamental analysis, um, I would say have at it. You know, get after it and and see how it goes. There are some there are some um, some really great tools out there um, that will allow you to to practice investing before you actually jump in uh, and. And so, you know, investigate those and explore those. I think, you know, whether or not someone needs a financial advisor has more to do with how much they like to do it themselves. Um, the value that I can bring to someone that enjoys doing it and is doing well, I, I don't know how much I can really help um, or any advisor for that matter. Uh, for those folks that, don't have anything to do with it. They like to do what they know how to do, and um, this is is scary or intimidating. You know, I, I would say, regardless of the amount that you have, it's not a dollar amount. It's it's based on whether or not it's something that you enjoy doing. And along those lines, um, for those who are a little intimidated or not sure where to start, where would you recommend as step one? Um, I want to invest my money, but I don't know if I should start with stocks or bonds or do you have a general recommendation? No. <laughs> That's okay I mean, too. Yeah. I can put Brian I mean, on the spot too. Yeah, Brian, I mean, I would Brian, do you have a, a better answer other than like Investopedia and um, e money or e trade or T D Ameritrade or anything? You, I guess are you asking where if I if I had a if I was just starting where should I put my money or are you saying what tools that you can kind of look for? Um, so the exact you, question you know, is if you're brand new to investing, where would you recommend starting? 
Uh, I would I would get some education. So Investopedia, like I said, is um, like Ryan said, is a great place to start. You know, um, the uh, markets are an easy place to get into and get out of. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do there. But if you're looking product specific, I would always recommend for my younger clients to start a Roth IRA and go that route. Ah, thank you. Yeah, that was that was something I did. I did not come back to. Uh, I think early on, one of our questions had to do with um, how to get started, and a Roth IRA was uh, one of the one of the topics that I wanted to hit on that I failed to. Do you want to briefly explain what a Roth IRA is? Brian, you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I'll explain. Um, so basically, what a Roth IRA is in a nutshell. It's a place that you can go if you have earned income and you can deposit um, up to $6,000 per year. But the beauty about uh, a Roth uh, so far is that the Roth, as it grows, since you've already paid tax on your money going in, when you are setting up to take the money out, you don't have to pay tax on it. So as your investments grow, um, you get to take advantage of, of not having to pay tax on that money as it comes out. Yeah, we're talking we're talking about um, tax free growth here, folks. This is uh, and I can't um, I'm jumping in and interrupting because this is a huge deal. If you have 40 years ahead of you, the vast majority think back to one of those first slides. We're talking about investing one hundred and fifty thousand over the course of, of 40 years at, at um, whatever that amount was and ending up with, with you know, $400,000. Um, to be able to put 150,000 in, pay taxes on the 150,000 and take out the entire 400,000 in the future without having any taxable consequences at all, that's a really, really, really big deal. Let's, after, after let that soak in for a second and then consider that we are at the lowest uh, uh, tax brackets that we've we've ever seen in this country um, with a three trillion dollar deficit my question to you is whether or not you think taxes are going to go up in the future or not so having having those um, taxes paid on those Roth accounts letting them grow and not have to pay taxes on that in the future that's a big deal for both Brian and I. Yeah. That's where I would start. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Anything. If you're going to do your own account um, and you're going to, you're, you're going to run it. Got to do a Roth IRA. Got to do a Roth IRA. Cause if you do really well, then you don't want to pay taxes on all that stuff. No. Okay. Um, so Roth IRA noted. We're switching directions a little bit. Um, this question says, in your opinion, which is a better strategy, dollar cost averaging or trying to time the market and buy when it's low? Judging off of the facial expression, I'm guessing we have a good answer coming. <laughs> yeah, um, dollar cost averaging all day long. That's not, that's a, that's a, that's a e super easy answer. Um, Timing the market, you're going to hear a lot of people talk about how they time the market and you're going to see articles about, hey, so and so told us to buy in, in uh, you know, April 17th and he's telling us to sell now. And they're picking on that person because he's the only one that got it right. Uh, everybody else got it wrong. And so uh, am I am I are you right, Brian? You're right with that. And I guess one thing I would say to that too is, um, you know, if you're trying to time the market, um, you might not get in. You might not get in when, uh, you know, you know, as you, as you watch the stock go up, you'd be like, gosh, I, you know, I should have bought it when it was at 10. Now it's at 12. Now, you know, now it's at 14, you know, um, it's really hard to time the market. And the best advice is if you are, you know, doing something like that dollar cost average in uh you'll you'll end up getting it at a better price you won't um you know you won't have to you know be johnny 
um, Johnny on the spot and be like, oh, I'm buying it today. You know, it, it's just easier that way to get in that way. So yeah, it's definitely dollar cost averaging is the best way to go. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, switching directions one more time. Do you have advice on investing in increments versus all at once? Increments. And why? Ooh. So, uh, because ultimately, you know, we never know what the market's going to do. Um, nobody does. The, the markets are a discounting mechanism based on people's perception. And, and so, um, the, you know, the best strategy is to, to use, I mean, I, ultimately, this is a question about feathering, right? Feathering in and feathering out of the markets. Um, if uh, 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 ratios um, are really high, then and you say, OK, well, I need to start moving money. I need to, I need to get out of the market. Do you move it all at once or do you move a piece at a time? And and ultimately, you should move a, a piece at a time, in my opinion. Um, however, if you're not sleeping well because you've got money invested aggressively and you're really concerned that the price to earnings ratios are, are way out of whack, well, then move it all, I guess. I mean, a, a lot of this is is not it's not a, a black or white answer. It, it's a lot of it's based on you and your behavior. And I think that's so important. I think a couple of times throughout tonight, you've asked about, or you've mentioned personal comfort le levels. And it really does, I think, just depend on each individual's comfort level. There's not a one size fits all or an always right approach. Um, and I think that's something we find throughout all of our young alumni series is with finances, it really is a personal choice. Um, so I just wanna stress that for all of those listening tonight. Another yep. great question coming in. Um, lots of good questions. So I apologize if I'm losing them in the chat. But if you were to see a young person seriously fail in their investments, what commonly was their strategy and why did it not work? <laughs> good. What, what do you have, Brian? Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, um, that is a really good question. And probably one, um, one answer that I would give, and there's probably multiple, is that uh, they panicked and got out too early. Um, again, as a young person, you know, the market's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to go back up, it'll probably go down again. Um, you know, you have 40 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years to invest. And um, you know, one of the biggest things that I've seen is they panic and get out too early. Yeah, if you look at the long term rate of return, the average investor uh, actually doesn't do as well as cash. And, and that's the biggest reason. Um, the, you know, the young folks that I talk to that um, have not done well, uh, many of them uh, were day trading. That's that's one of the, the the riskiest things that you can do when when we talk about in, investing and managing your own portfolio. Um, there there are lots of people out there that'll say I'm doing great, blah 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 blah. Ask again in a couple of years and see where they're at. And I think these next two questions are somewhat related. Um, so, what is the minimum time they should expect their money to sit in an investment? And how do they know when it's panicking versus when they it's feasible to pull money out? It's based on your situation and your goals and objectives. I mean, um, if if you need the money, then you need the money. Uh, I mean, it like we're to, we're talking about behavioral finance here, right? And, and at some on on some level, if if you can leave the money invested, well, I guess I would say if you've already lost twenty percent and you don't need the money, then leave it invested. 
And if you invested based on a long time horizon, if you're younger, you've got a lot of time before you need this money for retirement, um, then leave it in. It, it, the market has always recovered. Um, there here recently, we've had a lost decade, um, but that's the that's the first time. And, and there may be more in the future, but investing based on um, on rules, based on what you want the money to do and remaining committed to that investment strategy, whether it's dollar cost averaging or uh, you inherited a chunk of money and you want it to you want it for retirement then you know get it invested uh, whether it's it's a piece at a time um, but stay committed to the to the the plan that's some great advice um, and you may have covered this earlier I may have missed it but we got a question about hedging um, and sometimes you hear hedging as this form of like, a safeguard for investments. One, can you explain what hedging is again, um, and if it is a safeguard? It it can be, yeah, it, it can be. Um, hedging, uh, to use in non-investment terminology, it's uh, risk mitigation. Um, it's like uh, because I used to be a, a wildland firefighter. If you can forgive me, let me let me fall back to the fire analogy. Um, if, if you're standing at the bottom of a hill and you see a fire up on top of the hill, there's a huge risk that the fire is going to roll down the hill to where you're at. And so you would hedge that risk. You would mitigate that risk by, you know, using some strategy to, 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 to mitigate that risk. And that's what hedging is. Hedging is in, in the investment industry. It's, um, uh, I'm taking all this risk with Fang stocks, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna buy some options, or I'm going to buy. I mean, I guess in the basest, in the most simple terms, you could just buy bonds to hedge some of that risk, right? Um, we can get really specific on on the intricacies of hedging and exactly how to do it, but that's a that's a different that's a different guy okay thank you i have a feeling you're not going to like this next question either um you all are giving us some great questions these are hard ones nice. um so please continue to utilize the chat but this next one says how do i earn above average returns without taking on too much risk you don't I mean, by by definition, uh, above average returns um, means that you're. Uh, I mean, I would assume that average is the benchmark, right? Uh, so there are different benchmarks that correspond to different um, mutual funds or ETFs or even investment strategies. Uh, if it, I guess, I guess that would depend on how we are defining average. Right. If average is, uh, you know, the average investor, I would say, well, that's easy. Just buy and stay invested until it's time to start taking income or until you need the money. Um, if we're talking about average as the benchmark, well, I guess I would say either you need to take more risk than the benchmark is taking or you need to leverage high quality professional management. Um, not all professional management is created equal and there are mutual funds out there that consistently outperform their benchmarks. So, um, that's a hard question, but kind of easier than hedging. <laughs> Did you want to add something in Brian? I saw you no, come I'm off good. mute. I'm good. Okay. Man planner. Oh, I'm the man great planner. Questions. Um, these, are, these are really good questions. And again, feel free to utilize the chat. Currently, this is our last question, if not. Um, so I, and it's an interesting one. So do you have any advice specifically for women? 
statistically we do well in our decisions, but we are often more unsure of ourselves. Um, since women traditionally earn less, we often need to set aside more or start earlier. Any specific advice? Make sure that you're comfortable with your investment strategy. But that's, that's good advice for anybody. Um, not only your investment strategy, but also the, the individual that you're working with. If you're working with a financial advisor, um, make sure that you're, that you're comfortable with them. Make sure that you trust them. Um, other than that, the market, the market does what the market does. Uh, and women, if I can, I think that this is a safe assessment. Women are typically more conservative. Um, and so for, I guess for ladies, you know, remain committed to that plan. Um, put together the plan and then stick to it. I'd agree with that too. Put together a plan, stick to it. You'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. And keep breathing. Keep breathing. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Like <laughs> I tell myself that all the time. Everything's fine. It's OK. Great advice all around. I was going to end with, do you have anything you didn't cover? Any last minute words of advice? Um, anything you feel like this group has to know um, as they start their investing journey? And if not, that's OK, too. Roth IRA. I was going to say, don't be intimidated. Start small. You know, you don't have to contribute a ton of money. Start small and it'll grow over time. You know, time is the main, uh, the main factor here. But um, one of the things that I will say too is that, um, you know, invest it and fit it to your pattern and you'd be amazed to see what happens uh, down the road. Ditto. Time, the time value of money. Keep in mind the rule 72 and uh, the, the longer you can be invested, um, the, the more risk you may be able to take if you can sleep on it. Yeah. I love it. Well, with that, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions in the chat. Oh, we do actually <laughs> have one more. Just kidding. Um, just want to keep you all on your toes. Absolutely. Is it better Great. to pay down a mortgage or invest your money? So I think similar to the student loan question, kind of do you pay off that debt or do you invest? Yeah, and that's, again, that's a, that's a you know, what's the interest rate on the mortgage versus what are the expected returns out of the stock market? Um, and of course that, you know, the expected returns out of the stock market, that depends on how you're investing and how risky you can get. Uh, so, you know, that's a, that's a complicated question. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good question to ask a financial advisor in the privacy of, of your own space. So one thing I'll add to that too, is that um, you can have good, bad, or good debt and bad debt. A mortgage um, is a good debt to have. Uh, there's lots of tax advantages. You're basically investing in your house. Brian, your sound is a little bit off. I don't know if you can turn the computer slightly, but it did a weird thing there. So there's different types of debt fees out there. Still a bit muted. Can you hear him, Ryan? Yeah, uh, no, I'm getting the same audio that you are, but I'll pick up where he's um, where he's leaving off. Uh, there is absolutely he's he, that's a great point. There is good debt and bad debt, and a mortgage is is um, perfectly acceptable debt to have. Uh, it's it's also you know whether or not you pay off the mortgage. Oftentimes, I will. I mean, it depends on on who I'm talking. If we're talking to uh, someone that's getting closer to retirement, um, whether or not to pay off the mortgage before you retire, you know, that has a lot to do with um, how long you're going to be in the home. If if this is your final home, 
then I'm not sure that I would worry about it so much. Um, well, if this is going to be your final home, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, if there, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to make some changes, then that might be a discussion to have, but yeah, typically, yeah. Mortgage is not bad debt, right? It's not revolving credit, like a, like a credit card. Um, so it's, it's perfectly okay. And if your mortgage is, is, um, you know, high enough, there, there are tax benefits to, to having that mortgage interest tax deduction. Um, and then another question, how do you know if a stock is more on the risky side or the safe side? Um, uh, well, so if it's, I mean, if it's stock, it, it's risky. If it's bonds, then it's slightly less risky, though there are, there is an overlap um if we let's see if we go back to uh let's see where is it all right so if we go back to our risk return um uh line graph this is a line graph um you know corporate bonds uh high yield corporate bonds which would be right about here can be almost as risky as preferred stock. Um, and they can see a, a very comparable rate of return as well. So it, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tough question. There's, no, there's not really an easy answer, except that, you know, I'd say research, do a lot of research and a lot of learning. No easy answers in finance, huh? <laughs> I wish there were more. It would make my job so much easier. It would indeed. Um, we'll leave it open for a couple more minutes. If you have any last minute burning questions, continue to utilize the chat. I know we're a little bit before seven. I do want to just say one more thank you to Canvas Credit Union. Ryan, Brian, thank you for sharing your expertise with us tonight, um, as well as our uh, Alumni Association members. Your membership really does make our programming possible. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight, for supporting all of our programming. This is the last of our Young Alumni Series for the year, um, but as those who have attended before know, you'll receive a follow-up survey. If there are other topics you'd like to see, follow-ups on investing, home buying, car buying, um, side hustles, please do put that in the survey. A lot of our programming is based off of your direct feedback. So we would love to offer what you all want. Um, additionally, while this is our last Young Alumni Series, we do still have alumni programming through the end of the year. So check it out, alumni.colostate.edu. There's a wonderful little calendar tab. We would love to see you at future programming. We have some great webinars coming up with CSU Extension. Um, a Beyond the Beer series coming up, all types of good stuff. Um, so with that, I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you, Canvas Credit Union. Thank you, CSU alums, members, and friends of the university, and go Rams. Rams. Go Rams. Thank you all. Thanks.